Greetings, Nick with Sweetwater here, and in today's lesson we're going to be taking a look at one of the most important playing techniques in rock, pop, metal and blues guitar, string bending. <laughs> Now, to a great many folk, myself included, mastering the art of string bending on the electric guitar is of pivotal importance. It's a vital solving skill that's far beyond well worth learning. After all, some tasty, accurate string bending can add excitement and emotion to a solo. Take the first phrase of Brian May's epic solo in Bohemian Rhapsody, for example. Here it is without any string bending. Brace yourself. <laughs> Great notes, but there's something missing. We're missing the vocal quality of that amazing passage. Let's put in the bends, shall we? Those three missing all-important string bends. Now we're talking, that's more like it. Now, some people consider string bending to be a basic technique, but that's not strictly true because getting it right is not a cakewalk. Learning how to do a good string bend is definitely not a master this in five minutes deal on Shopping Network. It's going to take practice, time and patience. But hey, isn't that true of most worthwhile things in life? <laughs> Before we go any further with this lesson, however, I'd like to quickly point out that this video is not aimed at an intermediate or more advanced player. No siree, Bob! This lesson's intention is to help out future guitar heroes of all styles and ages. And to that end, it's a how to get started with string bending affair, if you will. Disclaimer stated, on with the show. <laughs> String bend is exactly what its name suggests. You play a note on a string, then bend that string so it gets tighter, and that makes the note go up to a higher note. Just like magic. Just like this. It hopefully goes without saying that the note we want to bend up to is a good sounding one, of course. So we've got to know where we're going to go with the bend and use our ears to make sure we hit the target note we're aiming for. Let's face it, there's nothing worse than a bad bend, as it sounds, well, awful. Let's say we're messing around with our old pal, the A minor pentatonic scale, for example. Right, we've got that on our heads. Now, here's an example of a bend that's pretty good. And here's an example of one that's uh, not quite as good. Yikes! The technical term for that last bend? It sucked! So the goal here is not just to bend blindly and hope we'll end up with a good sounding note. We've got to know where we want our bend to go and then use our ears, like I've already said, to tell our fingers when to stop bending or to continue to push because we're not quite there yet. Make sense? Your head and your ears have got to control your fingers. Got it? Not vice versa. The bend has to be accurate and in tune. That's our goal. Make sense? So in this lesson, we're going to learn the basics of the all-important art of string bending. Are you ready? Good. Let's go, my friend. Let's do this thing. This all said, if you don't know the A minor pentatonic scale, it would be really, really helpful if you did. And as luck would have it, there's a link to a video lesson right here. So get on it. Learn the sucker, because it's a good thing to know, and it will definitely help you in this lesson. I promise. <laughs> We can obviously bend any fretted note on any string using any finger. That said, as this is a starter video, we're going to focus our attention on learning how to do an accurate and controlled bend with our third finger on the G string, just like this. Now, to perform a good bend, as opposed to a bad one, there are two important things you have to know. One, a good string bending technique. And two, the note we want to bend up to. Duh. Remember, we don't want to be flying blind here. We need to know the note we're aiming for. We need to know our final destination of the bend, or we risk under or over bending, and neither is a desirable outcome. After all, we want to sound in tune and in control, right? So, logically first up, let's learn a good bending technique. Here's a good one. Thank you. 
And here's a not so good one. Once again, good and bad. Hopefully you've already spotted two things in that rather dodgy demonstration. Number one, although my principal bending finger is my ring finger, I'm also using my middle finger to help it. Why? For added strength, control, and of course, the added confidence that results. Two fingers will always be stronger than one. And your middle finger is just hanging out, so let's use it. It's better to do a two-fingered bend than a one-fingered bend. <laughs> is way better than this. Yep, like I just said, the two-fingered way has more strength and more control. Nice. And if you want even more strength and control, you can do this. Call in your first finger as extra reinforcement too. Just like this. Yeah, I definitely needed three fingers for that last big bend because it was a large one. And incidentally, using two or more fingers like this to perform a string bend is called reinforced bending, a name that makes perfect sense and is also a logical thing to do. Very logical. The other thing you've probably noticed is where my fretboard thumb is. It's not hiding behind the neck like that. That's no good. No, sir, it's wrapped around the upper edge of the fretboard like this. The reason I'm doing that? To add even more strength and control to my string bending. That's why. The thing is, if my thumb stays behind the neck, even when I'm using three fingers to do a bend, I don't really feel in total control. Yeah, I'm fighting that. But when I bring my thumb over the top into interaction like this, yeah, man, I'm in control. It bolsters my strength and gives me that all important control of the bending. It gives my bending finger something firm to push against, and it adds, like I've said, to stability, and it increases leverage. Make sense? Good. And by the way, as an added bonus, when your thumb's over like this, it's killing some of these strings you're not playing. And remember, as Paul Gilbert says, the string you're playing is not your problem, your enemies are the other five. And this helps keep them quiet. Nice. But wait, there's more. There's also a third thing I'm doing that might not be quite as visibly obvious. Let's take a quick look at a slowed down bend, shall we? And again. As you hopefully just saw, my wrist is actually doing the bulk of the work, not my fingers. I'm actually just using my fingers really like levers and letting my wrist rotate to do the bending action. My fingertips are absolutely the point of contact with the strings, but as I've just pointed out, my wrist is doing most of the work. Let's take another look. See what I mean? To hammer the point home, here's what it looks like if I do the exact same bend without using my wrist. You obviously can't see what I'm feeling, but trust me, it not only doesn't look effective, it just feels clunky, it's harder to do. The sacred way of the wrist is much better. It's easier and more comfortable. Plus, as an added bonus, if your watch has a step counting function like mine does, it thinks you're walking more. So if you're practicing string bending correctly, you get your steps in. Perfect. Excellent. That's at least 20 more steps. Good. On with the show. As hopefully already made clear, mastering these techniques isn't a five minute affair. So please be patient, persistent, because remember, practice makes perfect. Always. No exceptions. Ever. At this point, I should quickly point out this. I could, of course, perform this bend by pulling the G string down towards the floor, just like this. Instead of pushing it up, like this. Both techniques are totally viable, and we'll do the pulling down one in another video. Right now, we're just going to go up and up only. Got it? Right. Let's get on with it. Now we've got our string bending technique in some semblance of order, it's time to suss out that vital final step, the target note for our bend. So what we're going to do to find our target note for our bend at the G string at the seventh fret is this. We're going to call on our old pal the A minor pentatonic scale, namely this bad boy. 
The note we're going to pick and then bend is the D note at the seventh fret on the G string. And what we're going to do is bend it up to the next highest note in our chosen scale, which happens to be the E note at the fifth fret on the B string, this one here. So what we're going to do is play the D note on the G string and then bend it up to sound like an E, like this. Got it? Good. Now, just so you know, this bend will be called a whole step, full step, or one tone bend in a lot of books and tabs. Why? Let me quickly explain so you know. As you already know, the note we're bending our D note at the seventh fret on the G string up to is an E. And if we play that E note on the G string, it's actually two frets higher at the ninth fret. Here's D. And here's E. Same string, just two frets higher. So note to bend, target note. Now, technically speaking, the musical interval between two notes on the same string that are exactly one fret apart is called a half step or semitone. So, logic would dictate that the musical interval between two notes on the same string that are two frets apart is called a whole step, full step, or one tone. Make sense? Two halves make a whole, right? So two semitones equals one tone. Geek speak over. Let's do our bend, shall we? So here's what I want you to do. Play the target note E and let it ring so you get its sound fixed firmly in your head, just like this. You got that? Then, using all the string bending techniques you've just learnt, slowly but surely start bending the D note up and use your ears to tell your hands where to stop bending. So once again, this is my target note. Now let's do a slow, controlled, correctly techniqued bend, shall we? And one more time. Target note. Now that's fixed in my head. Once again, proper technique, reinforce bending, thumb over, wrist doing the movement. Let's hit that sucker with our D note, shall we? I'll give myself an A plus for that. That was jolly good. Anyway, pointless self-congratulations over and done with. Please remember this. Number one, fix the target note, which in this case is E, firmly in your brain. Then bend slowly, listen carefully, and remember to use reinforced bending. Have your fretboard thumb as a firm anchor to push up against, and also use your wrist to do the rotation, namely the bulk of the work. And also, like I've already said more than once, please be patient and practice this a lot. Right, to close, I'm going to leave you with a couple of quick little bending exercises that were inspired by this cool Ted Nugent lick I stole from his seminal classic track, Stranglehold. <laughs> Well, something like that. Sorry, Ted. Anyway, here's the exercise. What we're going to do here is a total of four one-step bends on the G string, each one at a different fret with obviously a different target note for each bend. Duh. Here are the four target notes played in order on the B string. Firstly, E at the fifth fret. F sharp at the seventh fret. Then G at the eighth fret. And then finally, A at the 10th fret. And the G string notes are going to bend up at the 7th, 9th, 10th, and 12th frets, respectfully. Here's what the exercise sounds like. One more time. As you've just seen and heard, all I'm doing is this. I'm sounding a target note, then doing the bend, then moving up to the next target note, then doing the bend, and so on and so forth. Here it is one more time. (laughs) 
Sounds easy, looks easy maybe, but it's actually not. But fret not, like I said, practice makes perfect and you've got this. And also just so you know, there's a handy dandy link in the text below for some tab for this bad boy. So you don't have to sit there and write stuff out. It's already out there for you. The reason for moving our one step bends up the neck like this instead of just doing it in one place? Well, firstly, it's more interesting, right? And secondly, the string tension changes slightly as you move up and down the neck. So these moves make double sure that you're using your ears to control your bending, not just using your hands and praying. Hands and hope, no good. Ears, listen, bend accordingly, good. Now, here's part two of the exercise, and this one is the proverbial doozy. This is exercise two. Now, this one calls on you to play the target note like this, and then do this. Namely, hit both strings together so you hear both notes, and then let the target note ring on the B string while you bend the G string note up to it, just like this. And then what we're gonna do, obviously, is do that in each spot. So we're gonna do this. This happens to be a very cool bending accuracy exercise. Why? Well, if you over or under bend the bent note, the two notes will rub against each other in such a way that they cause a weird and wonderful beating type of noise. Check this out. Here's an over bend done slowly. Ouch. And here's the same thing with an underbend. Epic fail. So there you have it. Beating, bad, no beating, good. Now here's the whole exercise again, hopefully sans beating. And once again, you can find tab in the link below. Have fun with this, my friend. Be patient and persistent. And before you know it, you'll be well on your way to becoming a string bending master. So stay tuned for some more string bending shenanigans soon. I'm out. See you. <laughs>